When Adam Frankel was 25, he discovered something shocking. He wasn't his father's biological son, a secret his mother had kept from him his whole life. At the time, Frankel was making waves as a talented young speechwriter for President Obama. But the revelation upended his world and fueled a search for truth which exposed generations of family trauma. Frankel's debut book, The Survivors, captures his experience, and he sat down with our Walter Isaacson to discuss this powerful memoir. Adam, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. You know, I love this book. In fact, I think you even use it, that in the end, I cried, which I think yeah. you've now put yeah, as a blurb. But it's a very emotional book, but it starts politically. You get in a phone call saying, hey, come be a speechwriter for Barack Obama. Who, who called you and how that? I'd been waiting for that call for months. <laughs> uh, that was John Favreau, a friend of mine from the Kerry campaign. Uh, and after uh, uh, John Kerry lost, Favs went to go be a speechwriter for Barack Obama. I moved back to New York City. And when Barack Obama was deciding whether he'd run for president, I let Fabs know I'd do anything I could to join the campaign. And we'd exchange some emails about it. And that call said, he said, you know what? Gibbs gave me a little budget to hire a deputy. Uh, why don't you move to Chicago and f we'll figure things out? And that was as formal as things got with Fabs, and it was good enough for me. You know, you're the only person I can imagine who grew up as a little kid saying, yeah. I want to grow up and be a presidential I'm, I'm speechwriter. You even ghosted yeah. uh, yeah. uh, Sorensen's, uh, Ted Sorensen's book, who was a great speechwriter. Yeah. So you really wanted this. Where were you when you got that phone call? Yeah, I was walking out of a therapist's office with my mother in lower Manhattan. Um, months before, she had told me that my dad is not my biological father and that this was a secret that she had kept from me and my dad and my whole family. And uh, we had stopped speaking. I was furious, and I had stopped talking to her, um, which precipitated um, uh, a break of some sort. And uh, I found her in, her, in our, the apartment I'd grown up in, um, virtually unresponsive, rocking in her chair. Uh, uh, deeply upsetting still to think about. And, and um, I didn't know what to do. And I called my uncle, my mother's brother, and, and he drove from Philly into the city. Uh, and we took her to a psychiatric emergency room. Um, and during the months to come, we, for years to come, <laughs> we had a very difficult relationship. But in those months, we barely spoke. And so my mother at one point pleaded with me to go see a therapist with her uh, to try and repair our relationship. And uh, truthfully, I didn't want to go, um, but I was worried about her. I loved my mother, and, and, and I knew that it was her safety and her health that was on the line. And, and so I went with her, and we're walking out of that therapist's office, and Favs calls and says, you want to move to Chicago? That call was perfect timing, because I'd never wanted to do something more, and I'd never wanted to be in New York City less. Tell us the backstory, because it's your mother decides to have a child with another man and keep it secret, and you're that yeah. child. Yeah. Well, it took me many years to figure out that truth. Um, uh, but when I left the White House, um, you know, where I, I, I had essentially had an identity crisis in the White House as I started facing this, and I started asking questions. Um, I went back to my mother. Um, I went back to my biological father, who was a presence in my life growing up. I've known him my whole life, um, but as a family friend, not as my biological father. During one lunch with Jason Black, which is the name I give to my biological father in the book, uh, he said to me, you were wanted. I said, what? What does that mean? So you were planned pregnancy. Now, bear in mind, he was married at the time and had a family. My mother was married to my dad. So I'm, I'm thinking, what? I don't even know what to make. I don't know how to make sense of that. Um, I go to my mother and I say, uh, Jason, uh, Jason said that I was a planned pregnancy. Why did you want to have me? And my mom says, well, I wouldn't say it was my idea. OK. Uh, you know, I still, even telling you this, Walter, I can't even believe this is my life. I mean, I still have moments where I, where I can't believe it. And so I went back to Jason and I said, I just had one question for him. I said, why? Why did you want to have me? And he kind of leaned back. Uh, uh, we were at the Carlisle on the Upper East Side. This is the place he insisted 
on uh, having our lunches. Um, he said, well, you know, the idea of having a secret baby appealed to my sense of mystery and the erotic. And you have to go back to your mother's parents in some ways to start unpeeling this onion. I wanted to understand my mom and how this had happened, and my mother who struggled with depression and mental health issues all of her life. And as part of this process of trying to understand how this happened, I went back. I went back to her parents, who uh, were Holocaust survivors. My grandfather, uh, my mother's father, was at various Nazi concentration camps, labor camps, ultimately ending the war at uh, Dachau. My mother's mother uh, was in the woods for much of the war uh, with the re Jewish resistance and Russian partisans, uh, with a couple of her brothers. And I grew up with this legacy. I mean, a family gatherings throughout my childhood are just sort of submerged in the Holocaust and Holocaust stories. And my grandparents had thick accents. And when I was a child, I'd go see them. Many of my grandparents' friends were Holocaust survivors. All their the relatives were Holocaust, you know, they're in this Holocaust diaspora, essentially, in Connecticut. And the trauma never left them. I mean, I, uh, my grandfather, who passed away only a few years ago in his 90s, was an extraordinary human being. Um, I revered the man. Um, and he was a watchmaker. He was a watchmaker. And yes. you went up to see him once when he's fiddling, and he says something about be better to your mother. And he didn't know this story, right? It, that was very difficult for me uh, and our family. I mean, I, the, the truth that my mother shared with me was something that I didn't feel like I could tell anyone else because my dad didn't know. And, and it was almost a decade before I would talk to my dad about any of this. And, and as far as I was concerned, if my dad doesn't know about any of this, nobody else can know. In that initial conversation where my mother had shared this information, I asked if my dad knew, and she said, oh, no, it would break his heart. And I, I thought she was, I was sure she was right. Um, and so nobody knew. My mom's siblings didn't know. Her parent, her, her father certainly didn't, could never know. I mean, in that conversation, I asked my mom, does Zeta know, which is what I called my grandfather? And she was visibly shaken by the thought of her father finding out. But what happened was, after this revelation was made, my mother and my relationship deteriorated. And her family saw that deterioration, but they didn't know the reason. And they saw that I didn't want to spend time with her, but they didn't know the reason. Even later, I did end up confiding in my mom's siblings, but none of us told my grandfather because, you know, look, this is a man who had been separated from his family in Stutthof concentration camp. This is a man who nearly lost his entire family in the Holocaust, who lost all of his friends in the Holocaust, who never saw his own mother uh, again after being separated from her uh, at, at that concentration camp, and in his 90s, would tear up at the mere mention of his mother. You know, uh, how, what am I supposed to say to this man? Uh, he wouldn't. Uh, so I did. For, uh, I wanted to protect my mom's relationship with him too. I, I knew that if I had shared any of this with him, uh, I didn't know what he would do or how he would respond. I thought he would come down very hard on my mother, and their relationship was so important to my mom. And he was in his 90s, and I wasn't going to do that to her. Um, so he continued, even until his final years, to say, why won't you be a better son to your mother? You're not being a good son. And, you know, as he, um, as he lay in a, in a hospital bed uh, after a catastrophic, catastrophic stroke uh, at the end, and I had a few minutes alone with him, uh, one of the things I said to him, one of the things I said was, you're my hero, Zeta. Um, because he is. But I also said, you know, um, uh, Ellen, his daughter, my mom, uh, she'll be okay. We'll take care of her. I'll take care of her. Okay? And I, you know, um, it, but it was tough. I mean, I, 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 that part of what was so challenging about this whole experience is the way that trauma can be passed down through the generations, the way it reverberates. and strains relationships and creates all kinds of after effects that can't be foreseen. So you think the trauma of the Holocaust is passed down and was part of your family story? I do. Um, look, it's not a one-to-one. -one. Uh, I don't think that one can draw a straight line with these things. But we now know more about trauma than we've ever known in, in history. 
we know more about intergenerational trauma than we've ever known. Um, you know, there is uh, a, a woman named Rachel Yehuda, um, who I believe has appeared on this program sure. um, uh, at Mount Sinai, and she's done groundbreaking research in an emerging field called epigenetics. And the epigenome is a layer of information that sits on top of the gene, and it can be affected by external factors, the, your diet, pollution, and chronic stress. And trauma. And chronic stress and trauma, exactly. And uh, one of the things that she's found is that children of Holocaust survivors are three times more likely to display symptoms of PTSD when exposed tra to traumatic events than um, demographically similar people who are not children of Holocaust survivors. Uh, she's shown that uh, children of women who were pregnant on 9-11 and at ground zero and near ground zero have displayed similarly low levels of a stress hormone called cortisol uh, as their parents are also consistent with PTSD. So we know, we, we know that trauma can leave a genetic impact. Mm -hmm. How it's passed down is a subject of some scrutiny and, and discussion and debate, but we know that. We also know through other research that the way that families respond to trauma can have impacts on the likelihood of their children uh, developing mental health issues. What happened when you told the father who raised you this secret? So after um, almost a decade, I decided that it was time. And I called him up and I said, I I'd like to come see you tomorrow. And he said, you know, why? What's, what's it about? And I, I said, you know, I'd rather not get into it on the phone. Uh, you know, telling your dad that you're not his son doesn't seem like something you do over a phone call. Um, and he said, oh, and now, I'm, now you're making me worried. So I, but I get, I take the train up to see him, picks me up in the train station, and uh, I start to get choked up in the car. Um, we get back to his house, and I just start right in, and I say, you know, do you remember me telling you, Dad, many years ago that uh, my uncle and I took my mom to the psychiatric emergency room? He said, yes, he remembered that. I said, well, what I didn't tell you at the time was that the reason that um, uh, we had to do that was because I'd stopped speaking to her. And the reason I'd stopped speaking to her uh, was because she told me that I'm Jason Black's biological son. And I'm, I mean, I'm bawling at this point. I could barely get the words out. And through my tears, I hear him say, uh-huh, uh-huh, I know, I know. And I, I just, I, I couldn't believe it. What, you know? What do you mean you know? And he said, I've always known it was possible. And I made a decision a long time ago, Adam, that it doesn't matter one way or another. That you're my son, no matter what. And I, um, I was just a, 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 you know, a puddle of tears. Um, and gave him the biggest hug and the longest hug that I've ever hugged anybody in my life um, and just held on to him close. And then he said, is that all? Is that all you wanted to talk about? <laughs> uh, I, you know, now I know not to come to you for a blood transfusion. <laughs> so he you know, always knew how to lighten the mood. But we then uh, talked about it and he had had suspicions for the same reason that looking back I did that were latent. I, I don't look anything like my dad. Um, my biological father was a presence in my life. He always kind of hovered around my childhood, coming to birthday parties and such, even when my dad uh, didn't want him there. My mom would insist on him being there. And, you know, founding our relationship on that level of honesty and truth, we're closer now than we've ever been in, our, in my life. So what was it like when you told Barack Obama? I went to uh, Barack Obama's personal offices about a year ago, and you know, he asked, what are you up to? And, you know, I said, well, I'm working on, I'm working on this book. Whoa, what's it about? Uh, so I start to tell him, and I should, I should just say, you know, I was on his staff for a number of years, and I was a staffer. He was the president. You know, yeah. the time we were spending together, virtually all of it, um, with only a, a small number of exceptions, was, it was all business. There was work to be done. We were working on major policy addresses. We were working on major speeches. That's what our conversations were about. But this one was different. This one, uh, I shared with him all of this. And I, I got to tell you, I was very moved by his interest, by his um, empathy. Uh, when I told him I was writing about intergenerational trauma, he said, sounds like a real beach read. Yeah, right. <laughs> but I, I got to tell you, I was, very, I was very moved by it. What did your mother say to you when you said, I'm now going to write a book about it? 
she was very uncomfortable with this book. Uh, her family was, has been very uncomfortable with this book. Um, but she also knew how important it was to me, to my processing all of this. I think that, look, we've had a strained relationship. Anyone who reads the book will know that. Um, but I do appreciate that, that she knows that she did something that caused me a lot of pain. And she felt deeply that I should do whatever I needed to do to work through that. So we had a lot of conversations, many of which I write about in the book, a very intimate, personal information that is shared. Um, and she was supportive, and she knew that I could include it. Um, and it, it made her very uncomfortable, but she, she, did, she did support it. She never asked me not to write it. And then what happened when you sent her the galleys of the book? I waited. I waited. Uh, I mean, that was what I was dreading the whole time I was writing this book. I was dreading her reaction. Um, I should say, as context, part of the reason I dread it is because of her background uh, with mental health uh, issues. And I have seen her spiral. I've seen, I've been scarred by that experience. Um, uh, you know, as I write in the book, just several years ago at a, at a um, lunch in Brooklyn, she told me that she would commit suicide after she spent down her savings. I mean, I, I, I've heard these things from my mother. So I was deeply concerned about it. Um, but I didn't hear anything, so I called her up. Uh, and she said, oh, how are you doing? What's going on? And I'm like, so, you know, uh, have you started reading the book? Um, oh, yes, I finished it. Oh, OK. Do you want to talk about it? No, not unless you do. Um, so that was her initial re response. Uh, she also said, I'm very proud of you, which I thought was very gracious. Uh, she subsequently, we had a long conversation where um, she expressed in uh, different terms some displeasure about some of what I include. So it's been a range. And, and look, I get it. And I understand and, and I, it is extraordinarily personal. I put, this book is as raw and honest as I, as I know how to be. And a lot of that is about her. And so that's difficult. But I think and hope that she understands that this was important, not just for my healing, but our healing, my relationship with her, and as a family, and also more broadly. I mean, the revelations like the one I've experienced, people are having all the time with 23andMe and, and Ancestry.com. This is, this is an explosion of these sorts of paternity and other kinds of family revelations. I came across a term called late discovery adoptee which are people who find out late in life that they were adopted or donor conceived. And, and, and the emotional journey of that is, was very familiar to me. And I re read their testimonials, and a lot of it felt very similar. And so a big part of why I wrote the book was to show people that you're not alone if you're going through this, and, um, and that there is a path. And also show people that, that trauma has ripple effects across the generations, that, look, in my family, it's Holocaust trauma. But there are all kinds of trauma, right? I mean, as I was talking to researchers, I, I talked to a professor at Harvard Medical School who writes about post-traumatic slavery syndrome and the physiological risks of African Americans that white people don't face in this country due to racism and the legacy of Jim Crow and, and slavery. Uh, there are people who write about the, the soul wound in the Native American community, the legacy of the genocide as it contributes to uh, the host of social and economic challenge in, its, in Native communities. Um, this, is, uh, this is real. And I think that when we can kind of look at it that way and understand it um, and situate our own experience and our own trauma in the sort of broader historical lens, it doesn't make it go away. But at least for me, it helped me make sense of it and understand it and help me move on. And I hope it does that for other people too. Adam Frankel, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Walter.